what we are going to show you today is a demonstration on uh, dry bones of the application of the Dynafix a unilateral dynamic axial fixator using a technique of K-wires to ensure perfect placement of the shan spins. The unilateral fixator has been quite useful in the treatment of fractures and though in this demonstration we will be doing it on a solid bone, this can be done very easily on fractured bones too. In the distal humerus, the ridge prevents a drill from accessing the center point of the bone and the use of a K wire with a cannulated drill bit over that makes it quite simple. To start with, I would like to show you the parts of this fixator. As you see here, there is a female body and a universal joint, a ball joint, which is mobile in all directions. This joint can be locked by turning a cam nut, which locks the position of the joint. This slight movement when it is unlocked allows for adjustment and minor fracture reductions. This is the cam which works against a semicircular bushing. Cam is just like the crankshaft which you see in a car. In a certain position it pushes the bushing against the ball in the joint and thus locks it. It's useful to be able to assemble and disassemble the fixator easily and uh, any surgeon using this should practice these steps even before they start uh, using the fixator on the patient. This cam usually locks at about 30 to 45 degrees. More than 45 degrees, one should consider replacing the cam and the bushing because the locking is not going to be safe. The other thing that one needs to know is about the pin sites, the pins where they have to be seated. Conventionally, the seats are described as seat 1 from the left to the right. That is seat 1, then seat 2, seat 3 and finally to the extreme right of the picture is seat 5. It's a good idea to have the pins as widely spaced as possible which means seat 1 and seat 5. When one needs to keep a little less space between the pins seat 1 and 4 will be okay but seat 1 and 2 as shown here is not a good idea at all. That does not afford enough fixation. So the goal usually, ideally, should be seat 1, 3 and 5. What you see now in the center of the fixator is the central body locking nut. And this nut determines whether the fixator acts in a dynamic mode or in a static mode. At some point after fracture reduction, unlocking this nut allows a certain amount of dynamism. One should have all of these things ready before one proceeds to putting on the wire. The first wire I usually like to put distally perpendicular to the long axis of the humerus in the coronal plane and as I described earlier, slightly above the olecranon process. This wire, once it is put in, the fixator is seated around the wire with the use of special guides whose inner diameter is equal to 1.8 millimeters, 
which is the actual diameter of the long Eliza of K wires that we are using in this demonstration. Once the distal end is fixed, you can adjust the length of the fixator so that the proximal end of the fixator comes to lie. As you can see over here, the fixator has to be in the neck or distal to it, not into the head of the humerus. And that's where the second K wire is passed. These K wires pass through special drill guides like noted earlier. There are two parts to this guide. The outer one has the diameter which fits into the clamp and the inner one has a diameter which accepts a K wire. In this fashion, four K wires are ultimately passed, two into the proximal and two into the distal. All this while, an assistant is usually holding the humerus in traction which keeps it fairly well reduced and all that is then required at the end of putting the fixator on is some amount of minor adjustment. Now at this point in the workshop also one can check whether or not the wires are truly parallel to each other. As you can see in the proximal segment, I am holding this bone upside down, the wires are parallel, but in the distal segment, they are very obviously not parallel. And further on in this demonstration, I will show you how to get around that problem. Over these wires, you can drill using a cannulated drill bit whose diameter should be at least about 4.5 millimeters since the shan spins that we use with this system have got a tapering diameter of 5 millimeters distally and 6 millimeters proximally. So you drill over all of the K wires except the last one because that was the one which was not parallel. Shan spins of appropriate length are put into the holes which have been drilled. These shan spins like I pointed out are tapered and therefore one should be careful not to advance them too much into the bone as backing them out would loosen them. Now since the fourth K wire was loose, here is a way that you can make a little bit of correction. Seating the clamp on the third shan spin, you can adjust it up and down like I am showing over here and then directly drill using a drill bit. The drill bit being stiffer does not allow deviation of the hole. Once the hole has been made in a slightly flexed position of the clamp, again a shan spin of the appropriate length is put in. Once you have these pins in, it's just simply a matter of slipping your fixator onto these shan spins, leaving all the ball joints loose and then tightening the ball joints after the final reduction has been obtained. As you will notice in this, you should keep a certain amount of space between the soft tissues and the fixator. And
and the space which is left between the male and female part of the bodies can be used for further compression at the fracture site using an external compression device this enhances the stability of the fracture and the overall construct finally the central body locking nut is locked and this fixation is stable the self aligning male body is an important part and this takes the place of the standard body the difference is that it allows this translation as well as angulation at one end of the fixator the cam and the bushing mechanism is what locks the end clamps of the dynamic fixator the bushing has a groove which goes along the cam the clamp is first clicked on by keeping the arrow in line with the flat surface and then twisting the entire clamp this click locks the clamp onto the body further the position of the clamp is locked by turning the cam by about 30 to 45 degrees there is also a body locking nut which locks the body for compression distraction when the dot of the cam is light is in line with the arrow the clamp is free because the ball joint is not fixed to fix it one has to turn the cam usually about 30 to 45 degrees at this point the clamp is tight if the cam is moving more than 45 degrees that means it is not effective and it needs to be changed a similar mechanism is present at the other end to disassemble to remove it first both the dot and the arrow have to be in line and then the clamp is rotated at which time it comes off easily again to put it back it's slipped onto the flat surface and then rotated we will now proceed to show you the application of the dynamic axial fixator for the correction of a varus deformity the fixator has to be not exactly anterior not medial but anteromedial the first pin is about 2 cm below the joint line and the first pin has to be as posterior as possible this placement is very critical because unless this is as posterior as possible one will not get a good hold on the proximal uh, tibia the first pin is drilled freehand it's more or less parallel to the knee joint and on the x ray or image intensifier the direction of its tip would be around the level of the head of the fibula usually a 150 by 50 shan spin is required the fixator is slipped onto this 
can spin and unlike other applications over here both the proximal pins are put first notice here that if you put it as far away from each other as possible that is hole number 1 and hole number 5 one of the pins has got no hold usually most indian tba are not broad enough therefore you use seat number 1 and seat number 4 this provides a good fixation and here you will notice why it is important to get the first pin as posterior as possible at this point you can adjust the relative plane of the proximal fixation and once that is finalized drill through the actual uh, fixator using a 4.8 drill sleeve and the appropriate length of shan spin you will notice that they are parallel to each other the fixator is again slipped on the clamps are tightened the ball joint proximally is tightened in such a way that the hinge is oriented in the anterior posterior direction and then the distal clamp is tightened in such a way that pins put in through the distal clamp would give you a bicortical hold in the tibia usually this means that the distal clamp has to be slightly posteriorly uh, angulated another thing to note is the 0.5 to 1 millimeter of distraction which is incorporated before the distal two pins are put in. Usually at the distal end, shan spins of 130 by 30, that is a 130 millimeters total length, or some, uh, sometimes 110 by a 30 millimeter thread length is what is required. The fixator is then slipped off. The direction of this osteotomy is below the tibial tubercle. It is oblique from starting medially, passing below the tibial tubercle and ending at or around the head of the fibula. One must remember that this is an incomplete osteotomy where we keep the lateral cortex intact since the entire osteotomy is going to hinge around the intact lateral cortex. Fixator is slipped on again, care being taken while locking the cams that the hinge joint is in the AP direction. Notice the obliquity of the osteotomy and the intact lateral cortex. This is critical to stability. If it is not intact, the system is not going to be stable. Distraction device is applied. Notice now the acute angle on the medial side between the joint line and the long axis of the tibia. As you distract this, the osteotomy opens out, hinging around the lateral cortex. And if you notice the fixator itself, the angle between the pins is changing. The distal tibia now is gone into a valgus relative to the joint line and the medial angle between the joint line and the long axis of the tibia is obtuse in comparison to acute earlier and a triangular shaped gap has opened out. Ultimately over time this gap fills up with bone. That's a exaggerated fast forward view of the way it opens out. This is a rail which is the most important part of 
the LRS system, various lengths are available. When you see this end on, you can see the profile which has got a matching dovetail profile to the clamp. This allows the clamp to slide up and down in a stable fashion but does not allow it to rotate. The clamp can be locked onto the rail by use of a hexagonal nut which is tightened by an allen key as shown here. This is a central clamp where you can see five pin seats being pointed out, two at the end and three in the center which are clustered closer together. The clamp cover also has got similar hexagonal nuts which are removed by the allen key. And this shows you the two ends of a central clamp. The holes are meant for putting in the posts of a distractor, a compressor distractor. In front of this, you can see an end clamp which has got only one hole for the compressor distractor. As the name suggests, end clamps are usually used on the ends of an LRS, whereas the central clamp is used in the center. The point to note here is that the pin seats in both of these clamps are exactly the same, and as we shall see later, we will find that even in the micrometric swiveling clamp, the placement of the pins, the distance between the various pin seats is exactly the same. However, in an ordinary swivel clamp, one must remember that though this looks similar to a micrometric swiveling clamp in that this allows swiveling, there are only four holes. That's hole number one, hole number two, three, and four. Unlike standard clamps, which have five pin seats, a swivel clamp has got only four pin seats. And since these two holes don't correspond to each other. One must be careful when one is going to use a swivel clamp, it has to be passed through the swivel clamp itself. This is a micrometric swiveling clamp, which is an advanced version of an ordinary swivel clamp. The difference between this and an ordinary swivel clamp is the graduated distraction and change in direction which can be done. Turning the distractor gradually changes the angle that the pins describe to the long axis of the rail. A closer look would show you that the angles are marked out and as a rough estimate they can be read directly off. This is a T clamp which fits on to the end of an LRS rail as is shown here. This is fixed to the end of the LRS rail by a similar hexagonal bolt. The advantage of using a T-clamp is in metaphysical areas where you want one set of pins to be in a plane 
which is perpendicular to the other plane. For example, as shown here for fixation in the proximal end of the tibia. As with other components of the LRS, the T clamp also has a hole which can be uh, used to fix the compression device. This is not to be confused with a T clamp which has a ball joint since as you see here this is a solid piece whereas a ball jointed T clamp when the cam and bushing is loose can be moved in various directions and is fixed in one position only when the cam is tightened. Once the cam is tightened which usually takes less than one fourth of a turn, this is now fixed in whatever position it has been placed in. Now, this can be quite useful in fracture situations. This is dismantled in exactly the same way as a dynamic fixator would be dismantled. With the cam unlocked, the joint is just turned off and you can see the circular bushing. This same joint can also be used to fix a straight clamp. In this case, the pins are more or less in the same plane, but because there is a ball joint, you can get a little bit of angulation among uh, in between the clamps. What you see here is an important part of the the dynamization process. Towards the end of lengthening, the dynamization block is placed between two clamps. The dynamization block is tightened and the clamp close to it is loosened so that it is free to slide on the rail. With weight bearing, there is a controlled axial micro motion provided by the silicone plastic on the block. These are the templates which are used with the LRS system. As you can see, there are two kinds of templates one with five holes and one with four holes. The one that you see now is the template for the ordinary swivel clamp. This template can be used either for an end clamp or for a central clamp. The importance of this template is the fact that its holes will accept a screw guide through which one can insert a drill guide that you see here with an inner diameter of 4.8 and a screw guide with an inner diameter of 6 millimeters. Using the template, one first drills using the drill guide. The drill guide is removed and the screw is put in through the screw guide. This ensures that all the pins are parallel as well as the fact that there is minimal soft tissue damage. If you try and do this through an ordinary clamp, as you can see, the screw guide does not go through. However, the drill guide or the drill sleeve will go through the holes in the clamp. 
in a difficult situation one can use this to drill using the drill sleeve but the screws would have to be put in without any kind of a guide which is more damaging to the soft tissues rather than going through with a template there is an additional component a 2 mm guide for a k wire which can be used in situations where very precise placement is desired in the body after an incision is made the two guides assembled together along with a trocar are introduced into the bone the trocar is removed you can drill with the through the drill guide and the screw is then passed in through the screw guide this protects the soft tissues all the while the 2 mm guide wire or an 1.8 mm elizara wire can be used in situations where very precise placement is required and you don't want to make too large a hole so first you put in the guide wire check on fluoroscopy that the position is right and then using a cannulated drill one can drill over the guide wire through the 4.8 mm drill guide this is a shan screw holder very simple device the tapered shan screws that are available with the lrs system have two lengths or two dimensions one is the thread length and the other is the total length and any tapered shan pin that you see will have those two numbers written on it as you can see here 60 mm by 170 60 mm is the length of the threaded portion and 170 mm is the length of the entire screw there is also a hydroxy apatite coated screw available which is pre sterilized comes in a sterile uh, pack gamma irradiated a compressor distractor or a compression distraction unit can be put into the ends of a central and a end clamp and it can be used to increase the distance that is distract or reduce the distance that is compress in between the two clamps now we are going to look at a workshop for the application of a lrs to the uh, tibia depending on the amount of length that is required one should initially choose the length of rail that one is going to use for a transport indication the length of the rail should be almost as long as the tibia itself i will be showing you now the use of three templates with the purpose of getting the pins as perpendicular as possible we have uh, three templates there one of them for purpose of demonstration is a swivel clamp template but one could well use all three templates for straight clamps the first step is checking that through the holes one is able to reach the tibia 
at all levels. After appropriate incisions, pairs of 4.8 millimeter drill guides and 6 millimeter screw guides are inserted into both of the end clamps. Using a 4.8 millimeter drill, the first screw is inserted. Since this is going to be a transport, the rail has to be parallel to the long axis of the tibia. After the first screw is put in, one can rotate it, rotate the frame around the first screw to ensure that the second screw which is put through the last hole in the template also passes through the center of the tibia in the distal portion. In this hole one then puts in the appropriate length of tapered shan spin. With these two screws in the templates now form a guide for the passage of the remaining shan screws. Normally you would put in at least three shan spins in each of the clamps which are at the end and the transporting fragment would do with two. If necessary three can also be used. Now as you will see here after all these screws have been put in they are perfectly parallel to each other. This is something that is not usually possible when one does it freehand and therefore it's highly recommended that one use templates to ensure parallel placement of the shan screws. Once the screws are in, it's just a matter of sliding the appropriate clamps onto each of those sets of screws and a rail can then be threaded onto each of these clamps. In the workshop model of course we have used an intact tibia but the same principle would be used for a fractured tibia which was stabilized with fraction. The clamps are tightened to the rail, the first and the third clamp and you put in a distractor in between clamp number one and two. Depending on the distance between the clamps, one can either put it between the holes which are close to each other or the hole which is farther away. As you will see later, once the clamp starts moving and the distance between clamp number one and clamp number two increases, one can take out the distractor, close it down again and put it into the closer hole of the central clamp and that is what you will see being done here. It is reached the end of its length, therefore the central clamp is temporarily stabilized and its position changed. Once this is done, one can continue distraction. which then ultimately causes a compression at the original non-union site. Once the non-union site is under compression, the central transporting clamp is also locked. Later, once the regenerate is solidifying, to accelerate the process and to provide micro motion, one can place 
a dynamization block distal to the first clamp. Loosen the first clamp at which time the process of walking and weight bearing would cause micro motion at the regenerate site. In the case of the femur, for example, in a transport where there is a defect in the lower end and there is a limited amount of area where you can get fixation in the lower end, you could use a T clamp configuration for the LRS to get a good fixation in the distal femur. Here, however, for the T clamp, since there is no template, one would need to use just a 4.8 sleeve and not the 6 mm taper chance screw sleeve. These sleeves are tightened in the clamp itself and drilled using a 4.8 millimeter drill bit. In cancellous bone, sometimes a 4.5 millimeter drill bit may also work. Once the distal most screw is put, the next screw that has to be put on is right at the opposite end and again as was shown in the tibial workshop, one can move the rail up and down to ensure that this drill bit passes through the center of the bone. Notice here that the orientation of the rail is not exactly lateral but slightly in an anterolateral direction. This ensures that when the leg is in a slightly external rotated position of rest, the rail is not abutting against the bed. Using the rail itself as a guide, the remaining holes for the shan spins are then drilled and shan spins of the appropriate length are inserted. I would remind you here that the shan spins to be used with the LRS system are 6 mm shan spins and we recommend tapered shan spins. In case of a transport because of the anterior bow of the femur, there may be occasions when putting in a shan spin or a trocar through the middle clamp will not contact the femur at all or would contact the femur too low to provide a good hold or good purchase for the pin. In such a situation, we take off the template and use a clamp along with a sandwich plate. Basically what the sandwich plate does, it raises the level of the pin to about 5 to 10 millimeters higher depending on the thickness of the sandwich plate. The grooves in the sandwich plate are exactly the same as those on the clamp. You need extra long bolts which should be supplied normally with the sandwich plate to fix the clamp cover through the sandwich plate onto the clamp. Using this, when you drill, you will find that you are able to get purchase, a bicortical purchase through the mid diameter of the femur in spite of the anterolateral bow.
the osteotomy can then be done proximally if the defect is in the distal femur and using the distractor the fragment can be transported distally to fill in the gap again as you will see here the pins are better placed than they would otherwise be without the sandwich plate in case of a deformed tibia which also in addition to the deformity correction requires lengthening one can use two approaches one is the use of an ordinary swivel clamp which allows you to put the tapered chance pins in the plane of the lrs but at an angle to the lrs unlike the straight clamps where you can only put in the pins perpendicular to the rail first pin is put in parallel to the joint line and the second pin is put in perpendicular to the long axis of the tibia through the template with the use of 4.8 mm drill guide and 6 mm screw guide as shown earlier the rail and the templates then become a guide and you can see that each set of pins is perpendicular to the axis of the tibia that it is holding the templates have now been removed and replaced by the appropriate clamps and the osteotomy done as proximal as is technically feasible one of the approaches is to do an acute correction of the deformity you can also translate the fragment by loosening the clamp covers and a certain amount of translation as decided by the preoperative planning can be performed and the clamp covers are then tightened because there has been a certain amount of acute angular correction one needs to give a little longer latent period to this osteotomy before one starts distracting it using a standard compression distraction unit placed in between the two clamps the latent period would probably be around 10 to 12 days and gradual distraction at the rate of 1 mm is then commenced once the amount of required length is achieved both the clamps are tightened down to the rail the other approach is to use a micrometric the clamps which are being the nuts which are being shown have to be loose when the angular correction has to be done there are two distractors here one is in between this uh, micrometric swivel clamp and the straight clamp and the other is seen at the upper edge of the picture which is used to change the angle in this case the initial step would be distraction to create an area of pliable regenerate which would allow the gradual distraction once the required length is achieved then by turning the distractor on the micrometric clamp one can bring the pins to be more perpendicular to the rail and therefore the fragment 
gets correctly angulated to the tibia.